on your Wednesday episode of Locked On Raptors. It's another day off between games five and six. And so on today's show, we are taking your mailbag questions. Is Precious Achua the best defender in this series? Is Pascal Siakam playoff proof? And what about Fred Van Vliet? Should the Raptors even work to get him back in this series? Or is he best being saved for a potential second round date with the Miami Heat? All that and more coming up on today's mailbag edition of Locked On Raptors. Thanks for being here. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1167 of Locked On Raptors for Wednesday, April the 27th. I am your host, Sean Woodley of RaptorsHQ.com. You can find me on Twitter as always, at Woodley Sean. You can find the show at Locked On Raptors, and you can subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow it, I guess, is another thing you can do on the apps. Uh, either way, in audio form, it's available on all the platforms for the low, low price of On the House. So thank you in advance for uh, supporting the show there. And you can go to YouTube, big, big bump in YouTube subscribers yesterday. We're up to like 1920, pushing towards 2000. It would be very, very wonderful if we could get to 2000 before, I don't know, say a hypothetical game seven on the weekend. It's a tall order, but it's uh, it's playoff time. If you have a friend who's a fan of the Raptors, who wants a podcast, who wants a YouTube show to watch every day, go suggest the show. Word of mouth is still our very best friend in the world of podcast promotion. So thank you in advance for doing that as well and oh as always a big thank you for making us your first listen of the day all right on today's episode of the podcast we are digging into some mailbag questions it's another off day it's just the way it is there's time to kill here and there's lots of questions percolating out there so we're going to dig into a whole bunch of them talk about some individual player performances some team-wide stuff Fred Van Vliet his potential return in this series which I don't think is terribly likely but we'll talk about whether that should even be something the Raptors are looking to sort of get back in this series uh you know a a diminished version of fred van vliet versus no fred van vliet there's arguments both ways so we'll get to that uh we also uh you know have some you know bigger picture questions to talk about on tomorrow's podcast just a heads up i'll be joined by jackson frank from liberty ballers and basketball news dime he's a wonderful wonderful writer he will be joining me to dig into some of the big questions heading in to game number six for the sixers particularly for the sixers i kind of want to get the sixers side of things on this one and where things have gone wrong for them in the last couple games here but that's tomorrow. Today, we got your mailbag question, so let's get to it. Let's dive in. The first question here comes from Midlife Vertical, 40 and Dunking, asking, which team will the extra day off help more? I'm thinking Sixers, more time for MB to rest before Game 6. Yeah, I, I found myself today really hoping the game was going to be tonight. Like, the, the sort of one day off in between. I like that rhythm, and the Raptors seem to have found something here. It gives, again, Embiid that time to rest up that thumb. And I've talked about how the thumb is such a critical thing in this series because the way the Raptors are defending Embiid, it's really forcing him to try to be a superstar and you know win by tough shot making and jump shots and threes and stuff like that. And if he's not able to properly get those shots off because of the thumb, that's a problem, of course. He obviously has had some trouble dribbling and stuff like that too. A couple times where the ball just kind of skips away on him after he puts it on the deck. And obviously, if he gets a little extra time to recuperate that thumb, that is helpful. That said, it's a total thumb lig- ligament it's not like it's getting better anytime soon he's got to have surgery on it for it to fully be, be back to you know back back to full shape so i don't know if it actually is going to be that much of an effect for him having two days off as opposed to one I do think, however, it gives the Sixers more time to sort of dig into the film and dig into what the Raptors have done to sort of wrest control of this series back over the last couple of games and work on some potential adjustments and and tweaks and changes to how they're aligning specifically, I think, when it comes to how they're guarding the Raptors. And I am a little bit concerned there might be some sort of crazy defense they cook up for Pascal Siakam that maybe he'll be caught unawares to and and all that. So, uh, yeah, I I would say the Raptors, considering they kind of have if momentum is a thing, which I don't really know if it is, you know, that you can kind of oscillate back and forth. Ask the Minnesota Timberwolves what what momentum is like and if it actually is real. Um, but if the, it was a thing, it feels like maybe the two days off in between as opposed to one is a pretty good way to cut into that and make it so it's not actually a thing, even if it is to begin with. Uh, next question here. This one comes from uh, Jay Rich at A View Production asking... Outside of Pascal, who would you credit for the Raptors' performance turnaround in this series? OG, Precious, Barnes, Nurse, or other? 
This is a really, really good question. And I don't think you can really boil it down to one person on either side. I, I think there have been some pretty important changes the Raptors have made. And I will say, I kind of think the biggest reason this series has changed and flipped in tone and tenor is not a Raptors player at all. The Raptors are kind of doing the stuff we expect from them, right? It's really great to have Scotty Barnes back, of course. He's an extra bit of creation out there. He can he can take guys into the post and bludgeon them and score and, you know, just offer another outlet if there is going to be some extra attention placed onto Siakam. That's beautiful, of course. The defense he provides on ball with Harden is great, but that is where I think the series has flipped, is they made the very simple change that we were calling for for two games to just dare James Harden to score. Put him in single coverage, be late with the help, don't be early with the help, don't be ball watching, don't be shading over when he's driving and leaving those corner shooters wide open with tons of ground to make up on the closeout. They've instead, you know, stuck to those shooters a little bit more when Harden's had the ball in his hands, and I think that has really been a huge game changer. It's taken away the best element of James Harden's game, which right now is his playmaking and his ability to set guys up right in the shooter's pocket. It's not been as easy for him, and he's been forced to try to score. He's 0 for 10 on floaters in this series. I don't know. I can't remember who put that stat out there. I think it might have been on the broadcast, actually, on Wednesday. He's just, he's not hitting floaters. Actually, it was on NBA Today. I, I watched NBA Today yesterday with Malika Andrews. Great show. Uh, and yeah, it, 0 for 10 on floaters in the series through five games. That is insane and speaks to the decision the Raptors made to dare James Harden to score. It's what's caused, apparently, Joel Embiid to have, you know, not so subtle <laughs> shots towards James Harden after the game on in Game 5 on Monday, where he said, you know, he's got to be more aggressive. He's got to score with the way they're defending me. He's got to put it on himself to take more shots. And he only took 11 shots in the last game. So they're daring him to score, and he's not actually fulfilling the dare and, and, and sort of obliging to what they're asking. And so, yeah, I, I think that has been the single biggest change. I also think... You know, OG and Pascal and, you know, even Scotty, you know, I think the way they've changed up their def their defense on Tyrese Maxey as well, just sort of keying in more on him and, you know, trading off some of the resources they were devoting to Harden to then guard Tyrese Maxey, I think has been really effective for them um, because, you know, Maxey is a guy. It's kind of similar, honestly, to what we saw from Fred Van Vliet back in the Sixers series in 2019. Obviously not to the same degree. Maxey had, I think, more points in the last game than Fred did in that entire series. So it's obviously that was a more extreme version. But you're seeing Maxey really bothered by length, which has been a thing Fred's kind of dealt with against the Sixers for his entire career. It's always been a tricky matchup for him. And Tyrese Maxey, as someone who is not much of a passer, he really is just kind of looking to get downhill and score. When he's having his threes closed out on so aggressively by such long dudes, and he's looking for those driving lanes, but driving right into Precious Achua or Pascal Siakam or whoever is waiting there with an enormous wingspan waiting to contest his floaters, like, that's a problem. He's still getting to the rim. He had a couple flourishes, I think in the third quarter especially, um, kind of, you know, bludgeoning Kem Birch at the rim a little bit uh, and almost threatened to get the Sixers back into the game on Monday in Game 5, but... I do think just the slight changes they've made to, it's not even slight, it's a pretty notable change they've made to how they're guarding Harden and Maxi. Like, that's been huge, and it's going to now put the onus onto Doc Rivers to adjust and find another way to generate offense through those guys. And I'm not really sure how you do it, because there's not a ton of personnel. You can't just go and throw it to another guy and say, oh, well, you're the point guard now. We'll have James Harden hang it off ball, because they don't really have another point guard they can throw it to. And also, James Harden doesn't like to shoot off ball and is not a very good off ball player at all. So it's a problem, for sure. I think probably the answer if you're the Sixers is you just try to go a little bit more heavy in pick and roll with Harden and Embiid. You know, I've been a little bit concerned the couple times they've gone to that, the Sixers have. It doesn't seem like it's really a thing they're leaning on, even though it feels like a pretty decent way to get Embiid pretty good position heading towards the basket with a head of steam. Um, that said, though, the Raptors are still going to dare Harden to score in those situations. They're going to shade towards Embiid. They're going to drop back. They're going to, again, sort of open up those laneways for Harden, hope that their help can come. I do think the pick and roll kind of alters the floor shape a little bit more than your typical Harden driving into somebody or Harden taking a Tobias Harris screen or something like that or, um, you know, working a dribble handoff. Like, I think just a straight high pick and roll kind of puts everybody into motion in a way that potentially compromises what the Raptors are doing. But at the same time, the Raptors are rotating and playing on such a string right now that maybe it doesn't matter. Um, either way, I think we'll probably see a little bit more of that in this uh, game number six on Thursday. But yeah, the, the way they've changed Harden and, and sort of altered the coverage is there to me has been the biggest reason why this series has changed. Also, you know, again, it's not really one guy. I, I do think 
um, you know, the Fred Van Vliet thing is notable. And we'll get to Fred Van Vliet in just a second. Again, I don't want to say that Fred Van Vliet is not a, going to make this team better in the long run. They're not doing anything in the long run without Fred Van Vliet at full health. But in this specific matchup, I think it's kind of helped them that he's not been available the last game and a half. I think we've seen them kind of find peak form to bother the Sixers without him. And we can uh, continue to talk about that with some mailbag questions coming up in just a second here. And so many more that we have in the hopper to get to in just one. One second here. But first, before we do that, I want to tell you about our friends over at Shady Rays Sunglasses. They are an independent sunglasses company that gives you the features of $200 sunglasses for a fraction of the price. That means polarized lenses, well-constructed durable frames, and premium high-end finishes. And also something you won't find anywhere else in the sunglass game is Shady Rays Insane Protection Program. If you're like me, you lose sunglasses all the damn time. They're just they're flying. I one time jumped in a lake with sunglasses on that I had just purchased that day, lost them immediately because I'm a fool and because I don't really want to care about my sunglasses. They're just a thing to protect my eyes from the sun. I'm not looking to make a fashion statement. The one pair I do have is from a music festival in 2016. Then they're like bright green and they're just in the car because of the ones I know I'm not going to lose. I never splurge on sunglasses and never have good looking sunglasses as a result until Shady Rays came along and they have beautiful sunglasses. I have a pair right here. They're looking good. They have the finish and the design of a $200 pair without having to go and uh, spend $200 on sunglasses, which you're probably going to lose anyway. And again, their protection is amazing because if they, if you lose or break a pair, they will send you a brand new pair for a low processing fee. That's it. They will send them to you, give them a try. And you don't, if you don't love them, you'll pay nothing. It's a simple, is that plus 10 meals are donated to fight hunger in America when you shop with Shady Rays and make a purchase at their site so you can feel good about your purchase as well. Head to shadyrays.com, use the code locked on to get 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. That's code locked on for their best deal of the season 50% off two pairs, uh, two or more pairs of Shady Rays sunglasses. It's almost summertime here. I know it's cold as hell and it like snowed last night in Toronto, but. If you are getting ready for the summer and you want to stock up on sunglasses for the summer, Shady Rays, go use the code Locked On for 50% off two or more pairs. They are backed by 150,000 five-star reviews. Go check them out at ShadyRays.com. All right, we continue on here with your first listen of the day, digging into your mailbag questions. And I talked just before the break about Fred Van Vliet and how his injury and departure from the series has actually kind of been a pretty interesting swing point for things. And again, the Raptors are better with a fully functional Fred Van Vliet on the, on the floor. The shooting he offers, the extra playmaking he offers to take some of the burden off of Pascal Siakam, the incredible all-defense level defense he provides, he's amazing. He just hasn't been able to do those things in this series, and it's been a problem, and it's largely because he's just a completely diminished version of himself. He had such a load this season. He hasn't been very good since the All-Star break with the knee stuff, now the hip thing. I think it's been best for him to not be on the floor for the Raptors in this series. Hopefully he can be back for a Heat series where he's had a lot of success against Miami in the past, as Raptors point guards typically have uh, pretty routinely. Of course, the other point guard would be on the other side of the uh, the ledger there. Also hurt, by the way, Kyle Lowry. Uh, glad to see the Heat got through and get some rest. Either way, with the way the Raptors are playing without Fred Van Vliet, do they need to pick up a backup point guard in the offseason? Or can Pascal and Scotty manage the point in the minutes Fred is on the bench next season? We'd love to see Fred get a little more rest so he can be healthy for the playoffs. So... This is an interesting question because it does come to the whole sort of minutes management thing. Uh, our pal Vivek Jacob from, uh, you know, this podcast and Raptors.com shared yesterday the clip of Masai Ujiri from the middle of the season around the deadline talking about the minutes load the guys were seeing and why it was kind of by design. You have to learn and play in these sort of adverse situations if you're going to really be ready when the postseason comes. And for a team that didn't have title ambitions and isn't trying to save itself for four runs of playoff madness to, to sort of trudge through, it made a lot of sense, I think, to play guys heavy minutes in these close games. The Raptors played a ton of close games this season, and I think we're seeing the benefits of having those guys play those high leverage reps down the stretch and those high level minutes. And so... I am kind of split on this. I am not a minutes alarmist. I think I trust the medical staff and the biometric and the data they analyze and the sort of keeping up on guys. They know their guys better than anybody can know, you know, from outside. And, you know, the players themselves know each other as well. And they know what their, their limits are and things like that. And I think the Raptors do a pretty good job of, you know, managing that. 
uh, at least, you know, from the outside. Again, we don't know what's going on inside. Maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe they have no bio data whatsoever. And they're just going by the seat of their pants, in which case, hey, good for them, I suppose, too. But um, when it comes to Fred Van Vliet, I do think he is kind of a specific case because of the way he plays and because of the stature he has. He's a six foot dude. Six foot point guards get dinged up. They get hit. They get knocked around. They fall down a lot. They're going to be at more risk of wearing down over the course of a season. And so, yeah, I do think having some kind of backup point guard in place, whether it's a Delano Banton taking another step, whether it's Malachi Flynn fulfilling the promise of the six games he had during the post all-star break schedule before he got hurt with the hamstring injury, whether it's some outside help that they bring in to be a backup point guard in the mid-level or something like that. I do think having that in place to have a like for like, sort of like for like replacement for Fred VanVleet, you're never fully replacing Fred VanVleet, but if you have a like for like guy, you can swap in there who can soak up those minutes and make it so Fred can play 31 or 32 minutes as opposed to 39. I think that is probably a worthwhile investment for the team just in the interest of keeping Fred healthy. The other guys, maybe they just play 38 minutes and that's just the way it is of course if they have higher designs than maybe a first round exit or second round appearance next season then you'll have to manage and budget those minutes a little bit more effectively throughout the season but if that's the case you're probably looking at a team that has more margin for error to rest guys and ensure that they're not playing 40 minutes a night like the Raptors this season needed to play their guys all those minutes because there was no margin for error for most of the season they had like seven effective players they had to play a lot if they wanted to get to the position that they're in Right now, um, it might not be quite the same next year where there's probably increased expectations. You expect more internal development from guys like Scotty and, you know, Precious Achua to hopefully add to the win total next year. And it gives you that margin for error. So, again, I'm not a minutes alarmist, really, you know, but I do think in specific cases, the Raptors have seen this in very recent history, the benefits of pr pr protecting and preserving your diminutive point guard in the 2017-18 season. They finally got wise with Kyle Lowry chilled him out. He played, you know, what was it, like 31 minutes a game or something like that in the culture reset season, and he was fresh and raring to go for the postseason, uh, and then, of course, into the following year as well in the in the title season, where they were pretty careful about his minutes, too. Look, guys are going to get hurt. There's not much you can do about it. It's just the way it is. It's a professional sport. They're playing six months of basketball. Guys are going to get hurt regardless of the minutes they're playing. Bench guys get hurt all the time in 15 minutes of action. It's just the way it is, but I do think they probably need to find some sort of plan to ensure Fred doesn't have to play all of those minutes. And hey, maybe it is just Scotty Barnes as the backup point guard, in which case, that sounds pretty all right to me. Hopefully you're not overextending him in the process. But uh, yeah, uh, to sort of continue this thread about Fred Van Vliet, um, you know, Forever 2019 asks, are the Raptors more effective without Fred in the starting lineup? Caveat that he's been playing hurt. Yeah, I think in this series... They're more effective, but you are still seeing the effects of not having him in there, right? They've not shot well from three over the last couple of games. They're 15 of 26. Sorry, six, not 15 of 26. That's amazing. Uh, they are 16 of 65. My brain just totally screwed up numbers. They are 16 of 65 in the last two games from three. And even though Fred Van Vliet is not knocking his threes down at a crazy rate, he's still at 33% in the series. He still is a guy who you know is going to make big, important threes at, like, at sort of critical junctures. That's just kind of the way he goes. And not having that extra spacing out there, it does make things more cramped for Pascal Siakam. And if things... Get a little bit more intense in terms of the, the pressure on Siakam when he's on the ball. If they start sending two at, at, the, at the top of the screen or something like that for him as he's running more pick and rolls than he ever has. I, I do wonder if maybe you're going to feel like, damn, I wish Fred was kind of hanging in the corner waiting for those corner threes. You know, th th that's certainly a thing. Defensively, I think they are in better shape without Fred right now in this series specifically. And again, it's all matchup dependent, right? The Sixers are an entirely different animal than the Heat are or whatever other team the Raptors might come across. And Fred's going to be absolutely necessary in any other series that come 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 after this if the Raptors can pull off history here. And it seems wild that we're just talking about it as though it's like a possibility considering they were just down 3-0. But that's where we are. Thank you, Sixers. Um, but yeah, in this series, defensively, the Raptors seem to have found something, a nice little elixir here to help and, and dull what the Sixers are doing because everyone is six foot nine and flying around like maniacs. And there's no easy targets to hit. Whereas when Fred was in his, you know, lesser state and his hip was bothering him, his knees slowing him down, he wasn't staying in front of Maxi. Maxi was just getting loose all over the place and was able to either, you know, take those threes over Fred on those closeouts or blow right by him and get those floaters going, get to the rim where he's just been absolutely dynamite in this series. And the same goes for James Harden. You know, even Gary Trent Jr. has offered more resistance against Harden in this series than Fred Van Vliet was. So I do think defensively they're in better shape. 
the three point shooting really could come to hurt them. And if they are going to lose this series, I think it's probably because the bad shooting carries over from the last couple of games. The Sixers have a little bit more in terms of offensive pep and juice. Maybe they get to the line a little bit more often as well. That's always a factor here. Um, and maybe those three point, uh, that three point disparity probably comes into a little bit more play here, but um, defensively, absolutely. I think the Raptors are in better shape. Um, we will continue on here and get to a couple more mailbag questions to close out the show. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to tell you about our friends over at Built Bar who are making the best tasting protein bars money can buy. Go check out Built Bar. I talk about them all the time on this podcast and it's because we like them here at Locked On and because they make a really good product that we can stand by. I'm always excited for when I get my shipment of Built Bars. We get them like every few months. We'll get a new, you know, specialty flavor. We'll get a, this little, you know, mix box or something like that. It always makes me very happy because I know I have meal replacement bars because I'm not like a breakfast person. I don't love to eat a big breakfast and feel all heavy and bloated in the morning. But a Built Bar is a great way to offer the same thing that you're getting, the nutrients, the just the food energy, but without being all heavy and gross and making you feel like you've got a pile of eggs sitting in your stomach. That's not really for me. Built Bars are a great substitution for that. They have 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 grams of net carbs, and 17 grams of protein in your typical Built Bar. That's uh, half the calories of a standard candy bar and about an eighth of the sugar. So really recommend you get to Built Bars. They're a great way to feel indulgent without actually being indulgent. They have flavors for everybody, nut and nut free if you have allergies, keto friendly, all of that. If you go to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order, You uh, or you can get 15% off your order. That's the promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5 for 15% off at built.com. And that is a anytime promo code. It's not a first-time order. It's anytime you go to the site, LOCKED15 is going to get you 15% off of your box of Built Bars. Get a mixed box, get a single flavor box, whatever it is, get one of the limited time flavors. Go to built.com. Use that promo code LOCKED15. All right, we are here to round out your first listen of the day with a few more mailbag questions coming in. Uh, this next question here comes from Freddie Revis, our friend, regular question asker, asker surely to be uh, a, a routine uh, you know, guest on the podcast going forward, as he has been in the past. We love Freddie. He's wonderful. Uh, he asks, is Pascal Siakam becoming playoff proof? Look, everyone has bad games in the postseason. Everyone can be game planned for in some way. And I don't think Pascal Siakam is on the level of, say, like a Luka Doncic, where the shot making from Doncic and just like the overall floor control is just more or less unassailable. That said, he's getting pretty damn close. And the control he has over these games, the last few games in particular, you know, game, I guess games four and five, he wasn't really there in game three. But the last two games, he has just been in complete total control of the pace of the game, the flow of the game, the way the Raptors offense is working, who's getting their shots, where the ball is going. He's not turning the ball over. He's just been incredible. And we saw this all season long, and we saw him do it against one of the most difficult shot diets and the most aggressive scheming that anyone came across throughout the regular season because the whole recipe for the Raptors this year was throw it to Pascal, he'll make something good happen. Everyone knew that. It was game planned for. They would send double teams. They would send extra attention. They would collapse down on him at the paint. They would wall off and make him go from the mid-range and sort of work from there without being able to totally plunge into the defense and kick out from there. And he still made it work. They found ways to work around the orbit of Pascal Siakam. And he has been so in control. He's not like a sort of like a super neutron star that's like flaring off solar flares. He's like a nice tiny, tiny little sort of, you know, condensed. What's the kind of star that's chill and not blowing up? Like a red giant, like a red super giant, very low temperature star. We're talking astronomy here today, baby. Low temperature star, not like erratic, not causing all these problems. He's just there. He's not exploding for like six billion years. You can put set your watch to the to the giant red giant, the super giant, whatever, Beetlejuice, if we're gonna pull a star reference. Yes, I'm digging into my astronomy bag, baby. My third year astronomy class in university is really coming through. Either way. That's the kind of, you know, orbit that he's had around him, right? He's just been so steady and knows exactly where the ball needs to go. He has been just unbelievable. And that is playoff basketball. That is problem solving. That is sort of taking what the defense is giving you and, you know, responding accordingly with the right call and not throwing it away, not being overcome by the pressure and the duress that you're under by the extra attention. 
He's just been a fantastic. And look, it's not going to be there all the time. Sometimes you're going to miss mid-range shots, and that's going to cut into the effectiveness. And he's not Kevin Durant, where the mid-range shot for him is essentially a layup. He's like a high 30s, low 40s shooter from the mid-range. And that's a perfectly okay place to be. It's a good enough spot to be to deter the defense from just letting you do that all the time. If you can hit a couple, it's going to change the way they have to do it. If you have the touch on, and he's had the touch for the last couple games, you know, he's just... I said all season long, I thought it was going to translate to the playoffs, what he'd been doing because of the difficulty, like the degree of difficulty of what he'd been doing and the sort of what he had to overcome each night with what defensives are doing for him, knowing he was the main thing to try to stop and the main head of the snake to try to cut off, you know, especially in the back half of the year when Fred Van Vliet was a little bit, you know, diminished and Siakam was just going nuts. Like that is playoff basketball that he was playing kind of goes to the whole point of like getting those reps in during the season that Masai was talking about in that clip I referenced yesterday. Like it, it just, it's, he is really becoming playoff proof. Not everybody is playoff proof to the point where they can win a title and, and sort of carry a team on the back of their mid range shooting. That's a Kawhi Leonard thing. That's a Giannis thing. That's a LeBron thing. It's very difficult to enter into that tier. But as of right now, Siakam is like on the crust of that tier. He's just below it. And, you know, if he gets hot for a series, if he stays hot, has the touch for a whole series, his level of control and understanding of the geometry of the floor, where things are coming from, where the defense is trying to attack him from, it's just so brilliant. And, and I think to answer another question, question here from Freddie, which is what singular highlight most defines the Raptors, uh, the current Raptors ethos. You know, I think on offense, it's probably the possession in game three where, you know, they are a matchup hunting team. This has been their thing all year. And it just so happened that it was Joel Embiid who they realized, oh, this is our lunch for today. Let's tie, let's, you know, get washed up and start eating. They ran again like seven possessions we talked about this yesterday like seven possessions in a row against Embiid and I think the one that really sums up to me what the Raptors team is about is the possession where Siakam drives Embiid comes over to help there are two guys on him and he just ducks a little pass to Precious under the basket who lays it in that is Pascal Siakam right he he softens up the defense. He gets the defense a little bit more worried about him with his shot making, with his off glass finishes, stuff like that. And then that leads to the overhelping and then his ability to just find whoever is being helped off of. In that case, Precious right under the basket for an easy finish. Like that to me is kind of what the Raptors offense is all about. Uh, and on defense, I mean, you could take literally any possession from that game. Like, like it was just such a masterful defensive game. One of the best defensive games you'll ever watch. If you're like a huge basketball nerd and just want to go watch them play defense, like that's the game for you. I will recommend that to all my basketball nerd friends who want to know what the Raptors are all about. Cause that is like peak of NBA level defense right there. Um, so pick any highlights you want from in there, but on offense, I really do think that stretch where they pinpointed MB as a soft spot and just kept going at that and picking at the scab that is what this Raptors team is all about and to the earlier point of the other question like it's not pretty it's not maybe going to be the most sort of effective points per possession wise but in the postseason it doesn't really matter what your efficiency is as long as you're outscoring the other team that's kind of what it's all about and the Raptors have built this team around mismatch hunting and that has proven to be a way to win basketball games in the playoffs and the Raptors really seem to have uh have sort of you know, taking what they've learned from recent years, from having Kawhi Leonard on your team, realizing he can go and empty the clip in a game and win it for you. They seem to have built their team in a way that everyone can go hunt a mismatch at any given point. And that in the playoffs is a way for you to find easy avenues to baskets and then force the defense to overcommit. And then you're creating easier baskets for other guys elsewhere. So uh, those would be the highlights that I would point out as the ones that uh, really stand out to me. Um, let's finish this one off with another Freddy question. This one has to do with Precious Achua asking, is Precious the best defender in the series? And that's a wild question because there's lots of great defenders in this series. It's, it's really, really a difficult one to sort of cut into. I, I would say he has been the best defender in this series across the whole board. I think Pascal is like a bloody amazing defender in his own right. And obviously Joel Embiid is a fantastic defender too. When he's on, he was not on in game five. He had admitted as much as himself after the game. I would expect he's going to be a little bit more of his typical rim deterring self like he usually is in game number six. And the Raptors will have to adjust to that for sure. But 
Precious, I think, is the most game-changing defender in this series because he can guard all of the guys who are giving the Raptors problems. He can credibly switch out onto Maxi, and it's fine. He's been on Harden a ton of times, and Harden has called for a switch to get a guard onto him as opposed to a big. You don't see that with guards. You know, you're always looking for the big that you can just sort of cook and run by. That's been like the sort of way of switching. That's why Steph Curry is so damn effective, right? Oh, I got Tristan Thompson on me. Cool. I'm just going to bomb this three over his head, and we're going to laugh. Like, it's been just bloody impressive to see what Precious has been able to do. Obviously, the work he's doing on Embiid is the point of attack guy as well. He's not alone. There's other guys flying in from all different angles to help him out. But offering that initial resistance where he's not just getting bowled over on Embiid's way to the rim. He's not allowing Embiid to get that deep post position all the time. Like, he's just been insane. And I do think there's a very real world in which Precious Achua is like clearly the best defender on the Raptors by the end of next season. I think obviously there's still going to be some, you know, missteps in here, here and there. He's 22 years old, but they're few and far between right now. And the way he's processing things on defense now gives you a lot of hope that it's only going to get more refined as he goes forward here. And he figures to be like an all defense level type player. Frankly, the Raptors have like five of those guys between Precious, OG, Siakam, uh, Scotty Barnes, who is not there just yet, but has really made strides in the back part of the season and is very clearly going to be an excellent defender down the line. And then you get Fred Van Vliet. I mean, good luck trying to score on this team next season. They, they, I mean, they were incredible the back, back, back part of this season as well. They were the number six defense after January 1st, I believe. But like they had the juice to be very clearly like a one, two, like a Celtics level defense, I think, next season. And Precious Achua, to me, is kind of the ingredient that opens all that up. So yeah, he might be the best defender in this series. There's a world in which he's the best defender alive in the next five years at some point. And like is very much in that conversation. He's just amazing. So great question, Freddie. And with that, we're going to round out today's episode of the show. Thanks for all the mailbag questions. Always come back in tomorrow. Jackson Frank's going to come on. We're going to get the Sixers perspective. Today. Where have things gone wrong? What can we expect from Doc Rivers? What can we expect from James Harden? I mean, everyone in between. Will there be any alterations? Anyone we haven't seen yet for the Sixers? Maybe DeAndre Jordan? Fingers crossed. Uh, we'll talk to Jackson Frank about that on tomorrow's episode of the podcast to preview game number six in Toronto tomorrow night. I'll also do a live show tomorrow night after game six. So set your watch to it. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel so you get those reminders when those shows go live. I'll have the post for that ready to go tomorrow afternoon so you can go and just set it up, have the window open, and then you'll just hear me talking once I go live, probably around 10.30 or so after game number six tomorrow night. So that you have that to look forward to. Thank you so much for tuning in, as always. And uh, now go make your second listen of the day, Locked on NBAs. They're breaking down all the playoff action from the night before. They'll break down the Heat winning uh, and advancing on to the next round. Of course, you've got the Pelicans and the Suns series, which is wild. The Grizzlies had a crazy game last night. Go listen to them talk about the John Morant dunk for probably 10 minutes. Uh, that's what they'll do uh, over on Locked on NBA every single day on YouTube and on your favorite podcast apps. And with that, we'll wrap it there. We'll talk to you tomorrow with another episode of Locked on Raptors. Bye-bye. <laughs>